Tamaj Agar, thank you so much for putting all this together. This has been an amazing conference. You were instrumental in the planning. I can't thank you enough for inviting me out here to Slovenia. Well, thank you uh, for you to, to come to attend and to join your experience, uh, meeting other people in the area with us. I mean, we are a small community, but part of a bigger community, and you're linking these communities even stronger together. No, and I can tell all the work that you're doing too. So just to set the stage, uh, you're the president of the Slovene Nuclear Society, and then your day job is also head of planning at GEN, the big utility out here. Uh, yes, that's right. I have currently those two hats on my head, but this is not the whole story. So I began my career in nuclear at Research Reactor mm. uh, when I finished uh, first level of university training as physicist. Where, um, even before we get there, how did you think to join the nuclear field to begin with? Well, uh, it's kind of interesting story because when I was in high school, you know, uh, Chernobyl happened. So mm. it was uh, my high school time and I remember Chernobyl, something happened and it was a little bit of scary. The radiation was not something that I was confident with, but I was f attracted by physics already at that time. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I ended up... Uh, doing some research projects in high school. Uh, and our high school was tightly connected with Research Institute. So... Um, and the Research Institute here, that's uh, the Joha the the Johef Johef Stefan, Stefan Institute. Institute. Yeah, so they had a, a team there uh, working on uh, measurements, mapping the contamination of uh, Chernobyl fallout in Slovenia. Mm. So uh, my uh, study or my uh, this was a project work was mapping con contamination in the Republic of Slovenia from the Chernobyl. So, and what, what is the contamination? I know about the local contamination, but what actually spread throughout Europe? Well, in fact, it was um, volatiles that, were, that went into the clouds, uh, mostly cesium and iodine. Mm. And then with the clouds, they came to, to Europe. And uh, what we found out is very simple. If it rained, it brought down some contamination. Ah. So it was an interesting time because we were going around the country, you know, hills, mountains. We were <laughs> doing uh, spot measurements, taking uh, samples, uh, ground samples, grass samples, and so going back to lab, measuring. It was it actually really, kind of sounds like fun. <laughs> it sounds like fun, yeah. So we were not going to school. We had, you know, uh, <laughs> we were out of the school doing this field work. Yeah. So it was really a fun thing. And then, you know, then I started to, to learn what is natural background, how much of it came from the Chernobyl, yes. from where the... Uh, and <clears throat> we noticed that, of course, we had some cesium and iodine before, especially cesium, because it was from the fallout from the nuclear atomic bomb testing. Yes. In fact, you know, Chern Slovenia is one of the hardest countries hit by uh, Chernobyl in this part of Europe because we have Alps. So a lot of rain came down. So Austria, Slovenia really got... The majority in this because the part. mountains it concentrated the precipitation. Yes. Ah. I so see. even now um, you can see these differences in mountains. The, the the fallout was bigger, but anyway, the fallout from Chernobyl was ten times smaller than the fallout from the atomic bomb testing. Get out of here. Yeah. So we were really, you know, it was wow, something happened, and we were a little bit afraid, and we started to measure, but in fact, you know, the fallout was smaller. Yeah. So if you continuously measure the contamination, uh, we are now living in the less contaminated area since the end of Second World War, since the end of the Cold War. It's the interesting because when people hear about the word contamination and radioactivity, they think, oh my God, it's this persistent threat for, that's going to last for millions of years. But what they don't realize is you're radioactive, I'm radioactive, All everything has been radioactive. That's why we have carbon dating, because we look at two different isotopes, one's radioactive. So it's like it, um, the magnitude matters, it really matters. Yeah, it matters, and unfortunately, you know, the, the perception of this magnitude is emphasized or de-emphasized by media. Yeah. And if you, both these effects, Chernobyl, uh, secrecy behind the iron wall and so on, uh, <clears throat> Those times we were on this side of the Iron Wall, so, uh, I mean, the Western side, we didn't know what was happening in the United States, in, 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 the, United, in the States, uh, in the Russia. Yeah. Uh, what we learned about uh, Chernobyl from uh, Sweden first, uh, and then we did our own measurements and so mm. on. So, uh, but yeah, this was, I was still, uh, it was high school time, and then I had to select my university, I selected uh, physics, 
And then, you know, physics was fun. I was uh, doing applied physics. And at the end, you know, for your diploma thesis, I had, I was not in nuclear at that moment at all, mm. not in nuclear. Um, I was, uh, and then I, for my final diploma thesis, I had to select, I had to go fuel cells, hydrogen, uh, or, or uh, there was another open thesis was nuclear. Mm. So um, related, uh, fuel burn up uh, in research reactor and so on. And I was, you know, where can I, uh, what would I like to select? I was attracted by energy, conversion yeah. of energy. Uh, this is and also the blue glow from your trigger. <laughs> uh, no, not really. You know, uh, it's also my family, my background family. Uh, my brother is in hydropower production. Uh -huh. uh, so we were engineers in, in in my family. So, and I was really, I liked the idea of hydrogen, uh, fuel cells, electricity. Mm -hmm. You know, but the diploma on the nuclear looked easier. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking, okay, I should go out of this high school uh, university as soon as possible uh, for <laughs> private life. So I took the, <laughs> it was more straightforward. Yes. And then I ended up in, in, in nuclear. Amazing. And then, so what was your first few jobs when you got into the space? Well, the first jobs were really on trigger research reactor, uh, measuring the burn up, uh, how much, how fast the fuel is depleted. Can we measure it? Yeah, you can do it. Can you calculate? Yes, it's much easier to calculate. So then we were really doing fine tuning uh, and uh, comparing uh, measurements to calculations, comparing that calculations are accurate enough to be used in daily, day-to-day -day basis. And the same. I see. So you put together a model, a mathematical prediction of what you think is going to happen. Yeah. And then the beauty of these uh, trigger research reactors is that they're accessible. They're in a pool of water. Yeah. And so you can actually put stuff in, take it out, and then you can run a, a scan of the materials and compare that data to what you just predicted. Well, right. <clears throat> the, the models here are really how you depute, uh, how you use your fuel in core, in the reactor core. And of course, in power reactor, you need to operate core constantly. You don't have time to test it. Yes you need to produce electricity. And with those codes, you calculate how you can use the most of uranium you have in the core, how you position your fuel to get most of the heat out of the fuel. Uh, and uh, to have those calculations correct, you need to test them. And in trigger research reactor, you can calculate how much uh, heat is produced, and then you take one fuel out, you go for uh, <clears throat> outage, you can measure how much energy is still left, how your code was accurate, put it back in, test it. So you can you can test the codes. And what we learn, what's the practical application uh, once we understand this fuel depletion and we make even better models, what do we then use it for? Well, we, we use it to, to optimize the fuel cycle. So to first of all, to enable us to run with one core for 18 months, 24 months, without even the fueling. For a power reactor, for, for a, a full-scale reactor. reactor. I see. So the research reactors, they help us develop the models. And then we apply them to the power reactors, yeah. which have incredible commercial opportunity. Yes. Uh, and <clears throat> you also try to calculate as accurately as possible what fission products are produced, uh, how much uranium is depleted, how much plutonium is created and depleted. And then you can also calculate, is it possible to recycle? What would be opportunities to do the fuel recycling, you know, to recycle plutonium and... And how much cycle. difference is there between um, the fission products that are produced based on the fuel type that's in a trigger reactor, which is probably what, some sort of metal, like uranium, zirconium mix of some yeah. sort, versus your uranium oxide mix in a ceramic power fuel pellet? Well, the, the neutronic physics of uranium <coughs> in, in the power reactor or research reactor is the same, it's the same uranium. Of course, enrichment is higher or low, mm. something like that. And does that change the spectrum, how fast the neutrons are moving? Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the spectrum is determined by the moderator and the material around. So mm. the physics, the neutron physics of the uranium itself is the same, but the neutron physics of the moderator, the metal, there's, uh, there's ceramic in the power reactor, here is a metal. Uh, uh, how much water is around, reflector and so on. This, this determines the spectrum uh, and then the whole burn up is a little bit different. And then what is um, the distribution of the fission products look like in a trigger versus a power reactor? And how do you, um, if they are different, how do you take your learnings from the trigger and then adjust them for what you might think come out of a power reactor? Well, in fact, what is important is to know 
how your uranium will react to different speeds of neutrons, and then you calculate what comes out. When you know what fission products are, they will uh, decay naturally, and you can calculate accurately what you have in power reactor. So you can really calibrate your codes. You can calibrate your uh, cross-section libraries with those experiments, uh, and then you validate. And of course, if First of all, how you develop a neutron uh, cross-section library, you start with particular isotope, you test it in experiments, you put together. And what we are doing here in trigger research reactor is we validate integral, uh, integral calculations with the whole core and so on, which is the second step of uh, validation. The first step is on, on lower levels, on cross-section libraries, which is done mostly by bigger groups. And uh, the Everything is going together at Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris and in Vienna. They have special uh, <clears throat> divisions there. They're just collecting libraries, one important library source in the United States. So, Do we ever try to tweak the distribution? Has there ever been any effort to uh, moderate the speeds of the neutrons uh, proactively such that we can shift the spectrum in a way that produces less, less iodine, let's say? Have we ever made those types of experiments? Well. <laughs> I was uh, I was not hoping that you would go in that direction, but I was expecting this question. I mean, <laughs> can we tweak with nature? You know, <laughs> let's produce more energy and get less iodine. Uh, well, in fact, you know, um, the fission products are really uh, when you fission your plutonium, uranium, you get a whole zoo of isotopes. I yeah. mean, it's one thousand seven hundred different isotopes. Whoa! And of course, the Newton distributions are uh, are not this uh, are are um, can be tweaked a little bit, but they are always um, how do you say? Um, they're distributed. And there's like two lumps of them yeah. essentially that always kind yeah. of show up. But they are not like it's not like this thing. You have just fast neutrons and slow neutrons. No, it's always a connected function. Mm. So even if you tweak a little bit, you can increase high, uh, fast spectrum, decrease thermal spectrum, but you will also increase the, the spectrum in between, you know? It's like a connected function. Yes. Uh, it's not like in binary model, you have one or zero, it's always, you have everything in between. So yeah. what I'm saying is, whatever you do with a Newton, you will always have this whole zoo of fission products. Uh, and uh, you can then select those fission products that are dangerous or those fission products that can be used in medicine or for future energy production with separation, these chemical processes, and then reuse them. But really to do something in reactor physics to just say, no, we will have no iodine, it's really hard yeah. to do. And I'm glad you brought up the, the use uh, cases because so often we think of these radionuclides as dangerous, right, because they emit radiation. But in reality, they've only ever hurt a few people, and we've saved like a billion lives from medical imaging. So like a billion people have gotten medical procedures that require radioactive imaging, and real lives have been saved. So I'm glad you brought that up to remind us, hey, it, these aren't good or bad, and if anything, they're mostly good. Well, in fact, yes, technetium, for example, is an isotope. Uh, which is used in medicine extensively, and it's practically a fission product. So it, yeah. it comes from uh, that a fissioning yeah. of uh, uranium. Yeah, of course, you, you, for producing this pure technetium for medicine, of course, you have to have special targets which are pure, and then you go a special process which is really pure to get just technetium out. But in fact, it's fission product. And then even um, some uh, isotopes which are uh, beyond uranium, I mean, they're full of energy. They can also fission, so they are future fuel. Uh, and then uh, some other isotopes can be used for uh, agriculture, irradiation, for irradiation in industry uh, proposals and so on, uh, applications. Uh, I'm not saying that everything which comes out is useful, but yes, some fission products are useful. Of course, there's also a lot, some waste, uh, but the, the amount of waste going out of the reactor, really waste is one, two percent. So. We are talking about, you know, we are recycling. Industry can recycle 99, 98, 97% of the material. I mean, tell me another technology that is so close to zero waste technology. So crazy. Uh, here around. But we've almost inflated, like, uh, because it is so low, we've somehow inflated its magnitude in our heads. Well, uh, well, spent fuel is dangerous. That, that's, I mean, you don't want to go close to it. You don't want to uh, handle it with, care, uh, with hand. Um, you have to handle it with care. Uh, 
and we have to shield it. But the shielding around spent fuel that is needed to protect us is not, I mean, enormous. Six meters of water is more than enough. Yeah. And in water is really good shield. You can see yeah. through it, you can manipulate uh, fuel through it, yeah. and it shields fuel perfectly. Uh, of course, you need some cooling, so it's not passive shielding. For passive shielding, you need something better, like uh, or something more stable, like dry storage and so on. Like just concrete or steel. Concrete though. and steel. It, it, I mean, that's the other amazing thing about radiation that most people probably don't realize is to turn radiation, something that could potentially, let's say, harm your DNA, into just normal heat. All you need is material. You put material between you and radiation, it magically just becomes heat. That's it. Yeah. And there's another misconception of radiation. We are, we are talking about radiation is all around us. Radiation goes through barriers. We say, yeah, gamma radiation is penetrating deep and so on. And people think that radiation just goes around. But radiation is very similar uh, as um, radio waves. I mean, in principle, it's physically the same electromagnetic radiation. Yes. And we all know that uh, radio waves are around emitters. If you have an emitter, yeah. then we put our cell phones up to our heads. And, and you can hear it. I mean, if you go far away from an emitter, yeah. from your antenna, there's no radio wave. So yeah. you don't have a signal, right? Yes. The, the same is uh, radiation from uh, That's such uh, a good way to describe core. it. Yes. So the only problem here is that, you know, for, for radio, uh, the emitter is big antenna. Everybody sees it. For uh, gamma radiation, emitter is one nucleus or atoms. And in fact, if they go around, and we call this uh, contamination, so if we spread those small radios around, uh, radio antennas around, then we have also contamination, and then we have also radiation around. But if we contain those sources, I mean, emitters, then the radiation stays around and just around the source. So, and people mix those two things, mm. contamination, which means we spread uh, emitters around and radiations going from the emitters. Yes. So the, this is the first uh, philosophy of radiation protection is contain contamination. So we don't want our sources to, to walk around freely. So this is why we have also a lot of physical protection. We have uh, access, uh, limits to access to the sources so that we limit the sources should be there where they're designed to be. The next protection is, of course, uh, distance or material, put it around. It's also great uh, protection, you mentioned it, it transforms into heat. And the third way of protection is time. I mean, if you're exposed for a long time, of course, you, you, will, uh, you will gather more radiation. But if you go away fast uh, or you limit your exposure time, you also don't get a lot of radiation. It's the same as with some. If you are on the sun for 15 minutes, it's exactly. helpful, it's good. If you stay for one day, you will be burned, for example, here in seaside. Yes. <laughs> so limit time. So we have those three major, very simple approaches. And time in another regard as well, because if you just wait a little while, I mean, when spent fuel comes out of a reactor, I think like instantly you're at 4% of the total heat of what was being produced. Wait an hour, it's at like 1%. So like time of the radioactive material itself, it just diminishes, it magically goes away. Well, uh, yes, and this has a, it, so radiation is going on by natural way. This is physical constant. Radioactive decay is constant across the new universe. It's so constant and so embedded in the physics of our universe that we use it to measure the, the age of the universe. Yes, The yes. age of our planet. Yes. Uh, so it is something that is, cannot be tweaked around. Yes. And it gives us really this natural analog. Yes, radioactivity will decay. This is the only way that really decays to something natural by its own way. So. For example, toxic materials like cadmium, lead, uh, uh, mercury. Any heavy metal, really. Yeah. They, 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 they remain dangerous forever. forever. They don't change chemically, yeah, but radioactivity or uh, isotopes, they change by nature. So this is, but we should not, uh, in communication, this with experts, it's fine. I mean, <laughs> we are talking here, I'm yeah, yeah. fine. Uh, communicating this to public, say, don't worry about radiation, it will go away. This is, an approach that sometimes uh, it's a whole other challenge. It's all another challenge. Okay, so um, so part of your role uh, at the uh, Slovenia Nuclear Society is communication, right, with the public, right? Yeah. I mean, that is, you are essentially a brand ambassador for your country's nuclear expertise to the rest of the world. Yeah. How did you get involved in the organization? Well, uh, well, I was in in preparing my uh, diploma thesis, a research reactor, then. Uh, past president, uh, Andres Titer, now he's uh, also our honorary member of our society, he came to me and said, 
Uh, would you like to work something here? Uh, and we have some publications to translate in Slovenia about radiation. So, so I, I became involved. And then, you know, uh, the society is really small society. Uh, we are trying to connect all people in Slovenia working on nuclear. Uh, and so when somebody new came, young generation, we approach the young generation, always try to involve them, get them on board. This is how I got on board. But there must have been something special about you because I mean, you really, you really took it upon yourself to become active, to, to, to make this. You, you didn't have to do this. You decided to do this. Yeah, well, maybe this had, you know, my experience with Chernobyl and being in high school when it happened. I, know, when, I remember when I was a kid when we were uh, driving uh, soon after Chernobyl, close to our nuclear power plant. I mean, when we went to Ljubljana, to Zagreb and back, the highway goes close by. You know, I was kind of, I saw this containment. It was kind of, you know, a menace. I was just, yeah. um, I was just really hoping my father will drive fast by, so nothing <laughs> happens when we are just driving by. So then I, but I, I was thinking, I was learning more about, I wanted to learn more. Yes. So then uh, I came across a publication uh, called Radiation, and then I, read it in English and then translated in Slovenian. And um, I, I also had a luck or whatever. I was in my, uh, we had a compulsory uh, army service uh, at the time still. Mm. So we had to do seven months of army. And I was in a unit responsible for radiological, chemical, biological uh, defense. Was that a coincidence or is it, did you express your interest in the area and then they assigned you there? No, the interest was not expressed, but they look at, uh, you know, professional background. I see. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, and How old are you when you joined the compulsory military service? 20, 21, 22, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and it, through this, you know, I also got a little bit better knowledge about, you know, decontamination, detection, in, in field, in practice. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I also saw that there's not enough documentation there. Uh, was doing some translation for the Slovenian Army Forces uh, in this respect, and then I be, uh, was building on this knowledge and this work also then in society. So it seems to me like you got a lot of really practical, hands-on uh, experience with this space, which I think is just so important that it's not just theoretical, and that's why these research reactors are so important too. It really gives the students a chance to 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 touch things, to work with materials, to understand, oh, this process and procedure is not just on paper. Like, let me actually do it in real life. It's just like so important. Um, how did you then transition your career from the academic into the practical, into the applied? When did you start working for GEN? Well, uh, you know, in academia in Slovenia, it's also a tradition that we are very much involved in international cooperation. So after my uh, PhD uh, in uh, decommissioning and studies on activation of concrete uh, for the decommissioning. These studies needed for the commission. Then I went into the Institute for Strands Uranium Elements. It's the European Joint Research Center Institute mm. uh, in Karlsruhe, in Germany, in fact. And uh, I was doing some their research on transplantation of plutonium, uranium, americium, curium for future uses as fuel and so on. Uh, and during this work in international uh, arena, then I came back to Slovenia and said, okay, maybe it's time to, to, to shift a little bit uh, my work career. Then uh, in, I uh, went to, to utility. Uh, the utility was just becoming more independent at the time uh, and said, look, I would like to work here. And I know nuclear is part of our future. I believe in this. Uh, maybe we have something in common. That is how I went to utility. That's amazing to have advocates like you actually at the utility because it's going to be the utility is that drive this industry forward. They're the customer. Yeah. They have to decide to want to implement and build and purchase nuclear power. Yeah. Um, so it's great to have someone that's so educated actually there helping make those decisions. It, tell us about GAN a little bit more. What is the portfolio of resources that they have and how do they think about uh, supplying electrons to the country? Well, the, the, uh, Slovenia has two utilities, uh, two independent utilities competing on the same market. And uh, GAN has, uh, is the owner of the Slovenian half of the nuclear power plant, Kershko, and 
Uh, we have also hydropower plants on the Sauer River, the same Sauer that uh, the same river that also a nuclear power, ply, uh, power plant lies on. So you guys are like the cleanest utility that's ever existed, essentially. Right. Yeah. We have. Uh, <laughs> we are producing 99 of 99.6, 99.7. It varies a little bit of our electricity produced is carbon free. Amazing. So we have uh, a model for literally for the rest of the world. Yeah. Power. Yeah. And it's something that is really we see how those two sources, hydro and nuclear, can combine. You know. And we are utilizing both sources to maximize the output of electricity generation. Yes. Because we are using the same river, a little bit of the river used for the cooling, a little bit for the hydro production. And in the summer months, you know, the flows are low and we are optimizing in this months the operation so that we maximize the flow through the cooling of the nuclear power plant because it gives us more clean electricity. Yes. Instead of running this river across the turbines, which with small flow is more production. Uh, in fact, in, in really dry months, you know, the, the production of hydropower plants would be even smaller than the electricity needed to power the uh, main reactor pumps. Right, because the <laughs> <laughs> because the um, these hydropower stations, it's like a series of like 20 megawatts uh, that are just kind of strategically positioned along. How many do you have? Like 10 or 20 across the rivers? In yeah, the here? I mean, the. the the, the rivers here are, we have rivers and it's mountainous region, but still the rivers are used up. So practically the, the rivers are now the uh, chain of lakes connected one to another. Mm. Uh, so the water is running from one lake to another across the, the turbines. Uh, approximate power of each power plant is 40 megawatts. Um, and we have around 10 on one river. And um do you guys do pumped storage at all? Because it seems like with uh, such a connected set of lakes that you could imagine a scheme where you're, um, you know, when you produce extra even nuclear power in the night, you could be pumping water back up and then running it through the hydropower to boost your production during the day, perhaps. Uh, well, in fact, you know, this is a, a, another myth that there's too much power at night. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like that happened now for years, you know. Even in, in, over the day, uh, we have, of course, for the, in Slovenia, the peak consumption is 2,300 uh, megawatts. And even in the lowest nights, you know, when, when there's almost nothing, the, the power almost never drops below 1,000, the power consumption mm. below 1,000. I mean, so modern society are so dependent on electricity <laughs> that there's um, the, 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 the variations between day and night are becoming smaller. Wow. Uh, and that's probably also due to smart technologies that can help uh, big power consumers like industry uh, communicate with the grid such that uh, you can levelize the yes, distribution curve I mean, as well. This is something that we observed in utility over 20 years, 10 years, past 10 years, that all these energy efficiency measures and smart users and so on, these measures are driving to a flat consumption. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Even better for <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> yes. You know, and so we need more base load power, yes. not less. Yes. Uh, now the and the base load power is here to supply this base load consumption, which is increasing. But of course, you have those renewables, which are variable, and with those variable, uh, you, you need another power to compensate not the consumption but production variations. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, the world is becoming uh, a flatter line with respect to demand, but whenever we add the renewables to the grid, we're creating this uh, this line that just jumps up and down with respect to production. So we're making it match less, even though the world is naturally wanting to make our lives easier for us. <laughs> yes, yes. So so this is you know this duck curve in California going yes. on and. Here we have wind ramping up and down in, in Germany and affecting the European network system. Then we have a sunny day in Slovenia and we need to shut down power plants and then some cloud comes and we need to start gas or... Uh, and what's GEN's relationship with um, other countries' utilities? Do they buy and sell electrons directly or are there intermediary players that create a market between different countries? Well, the European market is uh, not totally integrated, but it's becoming more and more integrated. So uh, we, are, we have also a branch which is dedicated to trading. So we are also strongly trading across uh, Central and Eastern Europe um, and buying electricity from Ukraine to Italy, from Germany to Turkey, practically. 
And that has to be, uh, especially as Germany adds more renewables <laughs> to the grid and takes more nuclear offline, it seems to me that there's going to be a lot more trading happening just so they can maintain their steady consumption. Well, yeah, the, the trading is increasing and also our uh, in our uh, company uh, profits, uh, the, the trading profits are now growing fastest. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and uh, it's not like just trading about nuclear and uh, with renewables, renewables uh, replacing fossil fuel and so on. It's also trading east to west. You know, Europe is really uh, using more energy than we are producing it. Mm. Uh, in fact, with all these debates in Europe about uh, where to go further, renewables, renewables, what to do with nuclear, uh, our consumption is growing, but the production is not. Uh, wow, and why is that? How come production hasn't been able to keep up with consumption? You think the markets would naturally push it that way and planners would know to just, ah, just build more. We see what things are gonna look like five years from now. Well, not exactly because the markets are also becoming more and more volatile. Mm. And uh, markets are so volatile that uh, long-term investments are hard to uh, be decisions on long-term investments based only on market decisions and investors, uh, they, they don't happen. And why are markets becoming more volatile? Is that just the general economy? Uh, well, uh, the electricity markets are becoming more volatile because of the more renewables in the grid. Yes. Renewables in Europe, we have this um, trade-in tariff, uh, feed-in tariff. So uh, renewables uh, do receive a lot of uh, subventions. The renewables that are, cl uh, uh, that are, um, qualified to receive subventions are solar, wind, and small hydro. These are subsidies of some sort. These are subsidies. These are subsidies. And uh, national grids uh, are then, uh, they, they must use them. They, they must take them in the grid. Mm. So, uh, and of course, when there's a lot of, uh, let's say, wind and solar, the prices on the market go below zero even. Uh, and we have more and more, uh, I mean, it's not so common, maybe twice a year, three times a year, now have seen this year, that the prices went negative. Uh, but in such a regime, nobody invests in anything. Yeah. Right, because even though the prices are the price is going negative, yeah, it's not like uh, money actually goes negative. It's just an indicator of what what is going to happen, yeah. what needs to happen. And that indicator is saying... Well, in fact, the prices there are, are zero at the time. Nobody yeah. is buying, nobody is selling. And... Uh, Price being negative means that if you want to operate, you would even need to pay to the grid to operate. Uh, and um, be, But because we know we need rotating power, we need rotating reserve on the grid. Sometimes the utilities even keep power plants rotating so that when, you know... Even if they're paying at negative rates. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, what a disaster. So, otherwise, you, you are, we are not able to keep up, you know, ramp up factor when, when the night comes. Right. Uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> right. And because the ultimate rule on a power grid is if people plug something into the wall, they better get their electrons. That's the number one rule. Yeah, uh, that's number one rule. So uh, electrons are in the wall. And this is also, we are very reliable here in Slovenia. We are, our grid never collapsed since 1991 ever, except for a uh, uh, natural disasters, we had a lot of snow and ice and part of the grid collapsed. Mm. Uh, but this was just distribution grid. But as mm. such, we didn't have a, a grid collapse. So everybody takes electricity for granted, I know. completely granted. It's and, a curse. Yeah. It's a curse that uh, the things that are so important to life, we've gotten so good at building that we've made it invisible to the average person and then they don't care about it anymore. So this is uh, a, a big communication challenge is to communicate what is behind the, the socket. Yes. Right? Uh, uh, behind the socket, there's a complex system uh, from your house to the power transformers, uh, distribution, transmission lines, production, spinning reserves, uh, then the whole supply chain. Balancing, substations. Balancing, substations it's crazy. It's crazy. And if you go then to, to, of course, coal, gas, you know, how gas comes to country, how coal comes to country. So the, the energy system is a fundamental infrastructure system of our society right now. Yes. Uh, and of course, it's a big it's industry. It's also a lot of uh, people involved. But on the other side, it has also huge benefits. I mean, 
good access to electricity means uh, prosperity, prosperity, uh, equality. I mean, uh, we probably forgotten that if we don't have energy, then part of our society has to go out searching for energy supplies. I mean, which means it's and that's the poorest part of society, and that means they can't be investing their time in uh, contributing and making things and becoming wealthier. It's it's almost like it has compounding either positive or negative effects depending on how you cheaper expensive you make electricity. Yeah. So my personal belief is now that cheap or abundant electricity makes democracy work. Yes. Uh, and if we don't have this, we don't have communications, we don't have people time to participate, we don't have time to, to do this thing. And all this, when I hear, you know, energy poverty, people think, yeah, well, electricity bill will be bigger. It's much more than that. Much more than that. So let's talk about um, Slovenia and Slovenia's future, because I, I really just do think that this country is so amazing in that uh, your potential to become a leader in clean energy. I mean, your your utility already is a world leader in delivering clean electrons to people. And because the country is small, there's a real opportunity here. I remember we saw in a graph the other day at the conference, it was like, okay, your grams of carbon per person comparable to Europe, uh, you know, better than Germany, maybe, and maybe France is the best. Okay, fine. But you guys literally with one fell swoop, with building essentially one or maybe two more uh, nuclear power plants could bring your per person uh, CO2 consumption like down to zero, essentially down to zero. Yeah, uh, this would be, yeah, uh, it's not so. Buy a few electric cars for people and your country is the cleanest country on planet Earth. Uh, this is something that is can be done, of course, on, on paper. <laughs> it's easy because you have you know, a small number of power plants, you replace one power plant, the nuclear power plant, you have to also plan for the replacement of existing power plants for next one. So we would need one, two, three units, and that's it. But it, it really could be a model for the rest of the world because while I know some people might say, oh yes, well they can go 100% clean because it's a small country. I mean, the whole world could be broken up into groups of two million people. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you in here in Slovenia are two million people and you have a, a wealth of engineers, a wealth of expertise, a wealth of businessmen, um, infrastructure, know-how. Uh, two million people is a lot of uh, talent to, to affect change. And if two million people can prove, yes, we can build one or two power plants in the next uh, 10 years even, what you can then say is look across the whole world and say, okay, let's look at every group of two million people. How can we build two nuclear power plants there? And that's it, the whole world goes clean. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, you're very optimistic and I'm, <laughs> I really like, uh, like uh, talking to you because uh, this is something that can be done, but it's really, it's not so easy because we have also to decarbonize our transport. We have to decarbonize yes. our heating uh, consumption. We have also some other energy uses that are not directly connected to electricity. And we are sometimes saying, you know, we're now talking about electrons, we're talking about electricity. In Slovenia, we're using around 26% of total consumption is electricity. I say only 26. Uh, in in uh, more developed countries, like Switzerland, Norway, they have 40, 50% of final consumption electricity. So, mm -hmm. so but what I'm saying, what is the problem that we have still this 70% of energy consumption still totally dependent on, on liquid fuels, yes. uh, gas. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit, because I feel like, all right, so electricity, obvious answer, a nuclear plant, as ex even a Gen 2 nuclear plant as it exists today, good enough to produce clean electrons. Heat, um, especially when it's like district heating, very easy. You could even take some of the waste heat. In theory, you could modify a nuclear plant get some of the waste heat to turn it into a cogen facility, and all of a sudden, same thing, and now you've decarbonized your well, building heat sector. This is the technology that exists. We have several power plants, Gen 2, in the world that are really doing district heating. Our neighbors here, Hungary, Paksh, is heating its town around with heat. We have something- From the nuclear plant? From the nuclear plant. Ah, power perfect. So that's like another, like what, 20% of the carbon footprint yeah, or something, yeah. right? In, in Switzerland, they have something like this. Practically every power plant, uh, Western type, I, I know for sure, let's say Western house, they have already, uh, they're using small amount of heat to, to heat up, you know, the turbine hall, the offices around the power plant. Yeah. In fact, 
10, me 10 megawatts of heat is already used inside the power plants to heat, cool the facility. Yes. So, I mean, small town maybe uses 10 to 30 megawatts of heat, uh, something, and you can heat up a small town. So uh, heating small towns is not a problem. The problem is, of course, distribution on larger distances. Heat yes. is not... And then what about then um, small reactors? And in nuclear industry, we always call them small modular reactors, but let's just call them small for now. If you built a, a small reactor, especially I've looked at your guys' map and you've got all of these hydro facilities that have a, a pool of water. You could imagine, and they're each like what, 20 megawatts. You could imagine for each one of those, you also put another 20, 50 megawatt nuclear reactor, you've got your cooling source right nearby, you've got the power lines right nearby, and there's your distribution network of heat and electricity. Yeah. Uh, on the map, if you look at this part of the map, it's easy. If you look on the other part of, part of the map, which is like special planning, you know, space uh, is very prestigious. Uh, ah, yes. And getting an energy location that is licensed as nuclear location is not so easy. So. I was working also in the licensing department, so I had a little bit of experience with working with regulator, with, with ministries and so on, uh, environmental uh, agency. Uh, and I know what is the amount of paperwork, <laughs> uh, the amount of uh, workload on people to get a permission or permit uh, for one nuclear site. Yes. So to multiply this uh, by 10, Yes. Uh, I don't see... Uh, How do the coal mines do it? All across the world, I see coal mines that just destroy the environment. They they dig up stuff. They put stuff into the air. How do they get their permits? I think it's the problem really that... Uh, I don't know, because I'm not in the coal industry. <laughs> I know the <laughs> nuclear industry is really strict here. You know, We do yeah. everything by the book. Yeah. If something in the relation says, we do it. Yeah. If something in, in science practices, we do it. If we find a good practice somewhere else, we do it. Yes. We're really trying to follow the best examples. And in here, in, 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 we are very strict down to the regulations. So the question is, are regulations really on the same play, uh, level playing field for all industries? But they're going. But they're never going to let that happen because the fossil industries, the coal industries, they're going to play dirty, right? They're dirty fuel. They're going to play dirty too. They're never going to raise themselves to the standards that we're at. And I'm not saying that we should think of ourselves as lowering ourselves to their standards, but maybe we should consider the net po positive effect on society and say, we've got to do something to replace coal. We are the perfect substitute for coal. Coal really hurts people every day and it hurts the environment. Maybe we make a, a rule where it's like, um, if what you're, all you're doing is replacing a coal mine or a coal site, you can do whatever you want because obviously it's going to be net positive. Could we imagine a rule like that? Uh, well, uh, I would not speculate what could happen, uh, um, I would like to maybe change our focus right now to uh, something else. We know how to operate electric, uh, electricity grids. Electricity yes. grids in the Western world are well developed. We are connected. And there's another grid which is not so visible, but mm. it's the uh, gas grid. Mm. Cities, towns are quite well equipped with uh, pipes in the towns. Mm. And we are here working also with, let's say, um, Society for District Heating. Mm -hmm. uh, European Society for District we call Euroheat and Power, and you know, using waste heat for heating, and using uh, synthetic gas to supply clean gas. I mean, really clean gas, which means yes. hydrogen from nuclear power plants to your home. Yes. Using the existing infrastructure, uh, this Brilliant. is uh, an idea how you can really utilize what you have because you know the energy system is not just power plants and users. There's also infrastructure in between. I pipes. Mean, pipes. Uh, uh, grid. Uh, this is very important. There's a lot of uh, work was done there, so we have to utilize the existing infrastructure. I think it's brilliant. I, you know, I uh, I give uh, the fossil industry a hard time, but hydrocarbons and hydrogen, uh, these are these are amazing substances in their ability to carry energy. Yeah. Right, the energy density even of these liquid fuels. Yes, it's nothing compared to uranium, but it's pretty amazing when you just think, oh, we can move a car, a several thousand pound vehicle, uh, hundreds of miles on just a small amount of liquid. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I mean, in, already in high school, amazed by the how much energy you can put in uh, gasoline. Yeah. 
a gasoline is such a good uh, energy storage. Yes. We have to admit it. It's physically perfect storage. It's perfect. And but we can, in theory, we can create it in a net neutral way if we use an, another abundant clean energy source to produce these synthetic fuels. Yeah, of course. Uh, and uh, it could be, I mean, hydrogen. We have to create hydrogen. Carbon is a problem right now, so we have to pump carbon from atmosphere. Yes. Uh, and then we can combine it with hydrogen with, from nuclear power plants uh, using high efficiency, high temperature reactors to create hydrogen. And then we can create really synthetic hydrocarbons that can be easily stored, easily transported. It's a good storage for surplus energy. If there's anything as surplus energy, as I told you before, I don't believe there's <laughs> really a term surplus energy. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we can power our economy using the existing infrastructure. You know, we have a lot of people working in car industry. We have a lot of people working in liquid fuel technologies. Uh, this is a lot of people doing something and they're doing it good. Yes. Let's put them to work. Uh, let's put them to work. We cannot just say, look, this is the, the technology of the past. Uh, you go and you find yourself another job. This is, this is how societies decide to don't work. They don't work like that. Uh, I love this vision for the future. It's amazing. Uh, as we wrap up here, maybe you can just leave us on a note as to why this is important at all. I mean, we are we're talking about really the 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 future of the our planet. I mean, uh, the future of our civilization. Uh, the planet itself will rotate around the sun, and it will go on and on. But the the existing civilization, the the way we live is really uh, dependent on access to clean energy right now. And in the, we have seen how, how much we need this energy. Uh, we are trying so much to clean our energy systems. We were working 20 years now in uh, renewables, in, in nuclear, but uh, we, were, we are still at 20% on global just from renewables. We still have 80% on fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, this is our really goal and target. We should fa we should replace those 80% faster with something that is not emitting CO2 and poll polluting our air. I mean, polluting our air, dust, NOx, uh, this, those pollutants are really killing us, are killing our people, uh, smoke and dust are killing millions each year globally. Tomasz, thank you so much for your contributions to Slovenia, to nuclear, and to the world. Okay, thank you.